You can help support the channel by heading to our merchandise store and picking up some of our great aircraft designs created by our graphic designer. We have everything from fighters to transport aircraft, which you can choose to have printed on t-shirts, mugs, stickers and much much more. Head to the description below and click the links and pick up your design today. Thank you and enjoy. Tony, when did you first become interested in aviation? Uh, I probably came interested in aviation at a pretty early age. I grew up on a farm in central Kansas. Uh, my father had flown light aircraft. Um, they were gone by the time I came along, but his friends would come. We had a grass strip there, and, and frequently I'd get they'd come in and they'd give us rides. And so at a very young age, I was always interested in flying. So what year did you join the uh, U.S. Air Force, and did you always want to become a pilot? Uh, well, not initially. Uh, I played basketball uh, <laughs> when I was growing up, and so athlete, athletics was a big thing in, in, in my mind at the time. So I actually went to the Air Force Academy Preparatory School, which is, is right where the Air Force Academy is in Colorado Springs. And it was a way I could play a free year of basketball without – losing any division one eligibility plus you know it helped me get my grades up to get into the academy so i went there for a year first um i went to the air force academy and and actually after about six weeks i left uh wow. after i was in the cadet wing which is pretty unusual at the time we didn't have these stop out programs or anything like that and i went and played at kansas state university and the writing was on the wall you go to school there or play and the players there were you know, pro players, uh, Rolando Blackman, these kinds of guys that played for the Mavericks were there. They were all really, really good. And I could kind of see the writing on the wall. I, I never was going to really get much bigger. Uh, so mm -hmm. I still wanted to fly. And so called up the, the coach at the Air Force Academy, and he, he let me come back in. I played there for a little while. And so that's where I went to, to school for the next four years. Basically, I was a freshman <laughs> for three years in a row when you add up all the time before, but, uh, and so then from there, I, I graduated, uh, in 1982, got my commission and pretty much entered the air force uh, pretty much at that time. Brilliant stuff. So can you talk us through some of your, uh, some of your initial and basic flying training when you joined? Sure. Well, as, as you've interviewed other people in the air force, uh, most of us have, uh, most, most, folks go to regular UPT bases. Uh, I was lucky again. I keep saying I was really lucky in a lot of cases that <laughs> that we had a T-41 program at the academy that kind of screened your initial flying. It was basically a souped up uh, Cessna 172s, the program. And, and I just happened to do very, very well. And I got selected to go to the uh, to the NATO base in Wichita Falls, Texas, uh, NJEP, your NATO jet, joint jet training, pilot training base. And so you knew if you got into that training program that you were pretty much assured you were going to get a fighter when you right. graduated. So, again, I did very well in that training program. At the time, they were selecting people based on your flying performance, not so much your academics and your military bearing. And so, like I said, I did really well. I was just lucky I had, I had flown a 172, you know, back at, at the farm a lot. So it helped me. And, and that's where I went to, uh, the pilot training. It was a lot different than not a lot different, but the, the NATO, uh, countries, they wanted to do more flying. They didn't want some to, to be in the sim so much. They actually wanted the hands on flying. And so we did a lot more flying. I think, uh, we had like 10 check rides between the T 37 and the T 38 right. and we're a regular U PT base, they, I think theirs was a, a track of like six check rides. Um, we had Danes and, and Danish and D Dutch uh, students in my class. The Danish were really well. They were really pre they were pre-screened before they came over. They were really good pilots. Um, I had uh, an American uh, instructor and a, uh, a Danish instructor when I went through T-37 program. And then um, in the T-38s, I had a Belgium instructor. So it was really, really great experience to fly with all the uh, other countries and uh, just to be in that program. And uh, so, um, again, it was it's basically the biggest difference is there was a lot more flying versus simulator work. Mm -hmm. So 
So how long did your uh, like initial training uh, take, and did you know what aircraft you wanted to go on to uh, going through this process? Well, pretty much at that time, uh, it took about it took about a year of training, um, six months in each platform, uh, the T thirty seven and the T thirty eight. Um, and no, I really didn't know starting. I just wanted to get through the program at that time. Correct. A lot of us, you know, as we didn't have any idea what we we're up against other than talking to folks that went through in the, in the past. But um, as we got closer towards graduation from the T-38s, uh, my first choice was an A-10, believe it or not, okay, the Hog. Right. And uh, I just thought, wow, that's a cool airplane. It's, it looks like it's, it'd be something really fun to fly. And so one of my instructors said, we knew we were all going to get fighters pretty much. And one of my instructors said, well, when you, when you sign up your list, put down everything that starts with an A. So I started with A-10. And then the only other thing really in the Air Force inventory was A-37. So I put that second and then on from there. And uh, pretty much everybody in our class got F-4s. And they didn't have any A-10s to give out during that drop. And so I ended up with an A-37, actually an OA-37 observation attack as a forward air controller. So that was my demise. You know, at first I was like, well, it's not exactly what I expected as a fighter, but looking back, Mike, it was probably one of the best uh, things that could ever happen. The experience that you got flying uh, that type of aircraft and the mission that it did. So, um, I didn't frown upon it. Somebody, somebody had made mention to me that a, a fact, a Ford air controller was worth their weight in gold, and I, I didn't really understand what they meant. But, you know, when you start talking about close air support type missions where you have troops in contact and that type of thing, you know, you could make or break it. And then, of course, you, you know, friendly fire was a big deal. You, know, you don't want to drop on the friendlies. And uh, you, it was a big responsibility for a brand new lieutenant. So anyway, that's that's how I ended up in the A-37, pretty much. Yes, so let's talk about the 37. It's a fascinating aircraft, and I have to admit, I don't know much about it. So what were your first thoughts on the aircraft? Because is it basically a souped-up 30, uh, like when you were going through training a 37? Yeah, it was, it, it, Cessna built that. As I understood, uh, back during Vietnam, we didn't, the, the Air Force didn't have a light attack aircraft. So nice. Cessna took the T-37 and beefed it all up. It had a different landing gear, much heavier landing gear. Right. Um, they put uh, they put F-5 engines in it, basically, without the afterburner. Right. Um, it was built to be a light attack, so it would drop Mark 81s, which are the 250-pound uh, bombs. They had a little uh, a minigun in it, a 7.62 uh, a machine gun in the nose. When we were forward air controllers, they took those out. They didn't want facts strafing. They didn't want them to go down right. when you shot up. So, um, but it was a very, very maneuverable aircraft. Uh, my initial thought was, wow, this is pretty archaic. But, um, you know, it, it had a, hot, a, a lot of history, a lot of legacy to it. Uh, and then they, they started using them in Vietnam as forward air control aircraft as well. The call signs were typically nail call signs. Um, and so uh, that's what they used the platform when they brought it back here and they were still training with them. And at the time I was in, that's that's pretty much what I got. But it was a uh, it was a fun little airplane to fly. It would cruise to and from, you know, the, the ranges at about 230 knots. Um, it had tip tank uh, tip tanks on the wings. It, it, to me, it wasn't a great forward air control aircraft because the. Uh, the visibility wasn't that great. You had these mm. tip tanks on the end of the wings, and so you're trying to look over that. We would typically carry uh, four drop tanks, two on each wing of fuel. is a flying fuel tank um, with two pods of uh, 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 white phosphorus rockets. Um, so, And that's what we'd mark the targets with. Um, at night, we'd obviously go out with canisters of flares to, to illuminate the, the target areas. But, uh, again, it was a fun little airplane. Uh, we had them. Uh, I was stationed at Davis Mothin down in Tucson, Arizona. Nice. Just down the street was uh, the A10 schoolhouse. 
So typically we would control and, and train with the A-10s. Um, so that kind of went like uh, you'd call them up, you'd be, you'd be scheduled, you'd call up the A-10s you were supposed to work with, and you'd get a hold of their flight lead or their instructor and say, hey, what do you need us to do for you today? And when you start talking about forward air controlling, you know, there, there, was, there was low threat and there was high threat scenarios. Do you want uh, – which type of scenario do you want? Um, what do you want us to work on? And then we'd go out there and we would control them. Um, if you didn't have uh, if you didn't have any support, typically a lot of times it was kind of fun. We'd take off in a two ship, and we were both loaded with the little twenty five pound BDU uh, blue bombs. And one of us would play FAC, and the other aircraft would play the fighter. So we would control ourselves, and so you got to learn not only how to shoot rockets, but to drop bombs. I mean, the thing was, uh, like I told us, I mentioned earlier, it would, would drop Mark 81s. We never dropped any real Mark 81s, or uh, it was mostly just little blue bombs, but uh, it had an iron sight in it, so you learned how to drop manual bombs, which in today's environment, that was a backup mode in the F-16, and, and F-16 guys that never had dropped a manual bomb, they were scared to death to, to, to do that, but you know, we all knew how to do that, and it was a lot of fun because, you know, you had to be at the right place in the sky on, on altitude, on on the right dive angle, and at the right airspeed, and theoretically no wind, the bomb was going to hit the target. So it was a lot of fun in that I mean, regard. You've kind of mentioned a few of the strengths and weaknesses there, but, like, what was the big strength of the aircraft? Like, what was it like? I mean, was the, the Bronco still a FAC aircraft at the time? Yeah, I was in the... Uh, we were in the 120, or no, we were in the 23rd Tactical Air Support Squadron, which was under the 602nd uh, Air Control Wing. Uh, we had a sister flight in George, at George Air Force Base out in California. We we flew the Dragonfly, uh, and they flew the OV-10. Okay, so they were our sister. Um, you know, again, as a as a forward air control platform, I would say the OV-10 was much better. It was slower. It was easier to get your eyes on the target because whatever the ground commander was giving you, you had to relay that to the fighters. And, you know, they're out there holding and they're, they're burning gas a lot faster than you are. And they want to, you know, the fighter guys want to get their weapons off and get home. And it was really hard to make them understand, having done both roles now, to make them understand, look, we're talking to the, the ground commander on the ground. We, we're running three radios. You would have a VHF radio, a UHF radio, and an HF radio sometimes. And you're coordinating with the ground commander and trying to figure out where's the targets, what are the threats, uh, uh, where are the – Where's the friendlies? Okay, how are we going to run these guys in if the troops in contact are close? You know, you want, might want to parallel the run-ins north to south or something to restrict where they're pointing their nose because if they drop long or short, you didn't want to drop on the friendlies. And then you always obviously had to get final approval from the ground commander. So it took a long time to sit there and orchestrate uh, the whole mission and the fighter guys with their, you know, our fangs are hanging. We want to drop and get out of here, like I said. So it was hard to relate to them what all was involved. They just they just didn't really understand. Hey, give us our target, we'll drop. And then you had to go in, typically, depending on what type of uh, uh, scenario it was, if it was high threat or low threat, you had to go in and mark the target. Wow. Okay, so you, you roll in. And so you were. it was a very, very, very busy mission, especially for a lieutenant. And, you know, being new, that's why I said it was probably the best thing that happened because you had to learn – you know, kind of the basics of every fighter or everything that was going to drop, what their speeds were, what they could carry, how long they could loiter, uh, what their capabilities were. And so you got to learn all that. You got to learn all the ground threats because you're amongst them, you know, ZSU 23-4s and SA-7s. And you kind of had to know where the threats were, how far you could or how close you could get to them, et cetera. So in that regard, it was a really a busy mission. Um, in fact, you know, there were two scenarios. Low threat was you'd set up in a wheel, perhaps, and you would get your fighters to come in, and you'd set them up in a wheel, deconflict them, and you'd mark the target. You know, the white phosphorus would balloon up, and you say, okay, you got my smoke. Yep, they got my smoke. Okay, uh, 
go one click to the north, that's your target, this is what it is, and, and they would roll in, Lee would roll in, they'd, they'd call in, you might say call them a direction, they call in from the north, you'd, you'd pick them up visually to make sure they're pointed at the right target. Um, that was your responsibility, and then you'd clear them hot. They would drop, they'd come off, you'd, you'd see where their uh, ordnance hit, and then you would you would space off of that where you wanted number two and then three and four to drop. And so, again, a very, very busy uh, mission. And that was low threat. Uh, high threat, now now you're out there and you're standing off, you know, several miles back from where the high threats were, and the fighters might be holding at an IP. You'd give them your nine line, you know, basically your heading and your, your distance and what the threats were, what the friendlies were. And once they copied all that down and they might be able to put in uh, coordinates or, or uh, in their in their system, which would lead them pretty much to the target. But once uh, they called ready or whatever, you'd clear them hot, which mean, meant that once they departed, you know, you could still abort them if you needed to. But once they departed, they were cleared to drop. Um, so, uh, again, that was a very... Uh, a very, uh, I just brought up a story. <laughs> that was a very interesting mission as well. I was going to tell you, that's the only time probably in my career that I had anybody shoot something at me. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, we cleared, and actually we were we were controlling, it was an exercise, and we were controlling our own aircraft. They were playing fighters. And right, uh, it, right. was, it was a training mission, and uh, myself and another guy were out on this knoll, in the Goldwater Ranges, there we're on the North Tack. We cleared we cleared the fighters in hot from the IP. It was a high threat scenario, and we're up on high elevation on this knoll. And I'm telling my buddy, I go, you know, those guys should be pulling up, you know, right over there pretty soon. And I don't see them, and I don't mm. see them. And finally, I kind of look to my right, and just as I did this, I see the nose of this A-37 coming up. <laughs> and before I could abort or say anything, four white phosphorus rockets came up, came off, and they were aimed right at us. Wow. And it was from you know maybe five kilometers away. Okay, they're in the air now. What do you do? You're yeah. standing on this knoll, and they just launched them at you. So, you know, you couldn't really run. And fortunately, you know, the first one impacted just over on the other side of the hill, and then the the three remaining ones hit a little bit longer. But I had no idea. And those aren't a real large ordnance. But the noise they made, really, really, really loud. And uh, anyway, you know, we knocked it off, and uh, the flight lead goes, oh, my God, well, he just got disoriented, and he, and he fired on the friendlies. And so he saved everything up and went home. It was a flight commander. I'll never forget it. And I go, wow, that was, that was pretty bad. <laughs> and he went home. So, But anyway, no, it was a very good mission. Um, so the strengths of that airplane, I mean, it was – it was old, and it knew what it, everybody knew what its capabilities were. But as a as a platform to control out of, um, it just was it was kind of hard to see out of. Um, obviously, after after our squadron left, or they shut down the, the A thirty seven unit, then the OA tens came in. The A tens came in and filled that role as a forward air controller, and that's what the task flew then for a while. Mm -hmm. And I think they still may do that. I mean, you also you know you could. You could be a, a forward air controller out of an F-16 if you wanted to, you know, fast facts. They, they did it back in Vietnam as well. So, um, but you, you got that experience. And it was, I, I don't regret it at all looking back now. We also had to go out on the ground for, you know, maybe a third of the year and actually hook up with an Army battalion wherever we were at training-wise. And uh, that was always interesting as well sometimes you might get with the armor battalion or something and they're driving tanks around and you go meet up with their s3 and their intel and find out what their little battle plan was and what their objectives were and you go okay where do you want the air and <laughs> they tell you okay well this is what our plan is and we go okay we're out of here and you get as far away from them as you could because a lot of times they'd do night ops and you'd you drive and get away from them or find a huge tree to park by because you know, in the middle of the night, they were all blacked out. They had, you know, there was all, all night vision, and you didn't know if they're going to run over you or not. So you got by a big, big uh, tree and camped there, and uh, you met up with them the next day and, and called in the air for them. Um, the Army, 
the Army typically, you know, now I think they call them TACPs. We were ground facts, uh, tactical alert control parties, and uh, they actually, I think, are letting the Army uh, individuals themselves control the air. But back then, it was, it was way taboo. No, man, the Army people, nobody else except the Air Force could control their own aircraft. And uh, I think they've kind of relinquished on that and, and trained the Army guys to do that as well now. So, but it's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. I'm, a lot of good numbers. Absolutely. It sounds like a really rewarding mission and aircraft to fly. But how many hours did you get on the Dragonfly? Oh, gosh. I probably ended up somewhere over 800 hours. I know I had. Wow. It. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't a time guy. I would track the time, obviously, and record it. But, you know, it had been nice to have gotten 1,000 hours. and But eight hour, 800 hours, that's a long time in it. Um, typical mission was maybe an hour and a half long you'd go out to the ranges from tucson to the west gold water ranges and then uh, do your mission and come back we did a lot of uh that was the first time in that aircraft uh that we you know i'd ever been to nellis to red flag nice and so uh all good learning experiences so let's get on to the viper how did this aircraft come into your radar as it were did you choose or were you just posted there well by that time uh having flown around the a10s a lot as a controller um i still kind of wanted an a10 and so they based your performance uh in that squadron on what you would get when you got reassigned so the leadership would you would kind of rank order everybody, and um, again I said, well maybe I, I said I, I think I want an A10, <laughs> <laughs> and my ops officer came up to me says Tony he said you did way well enough you could easily go and fly you know we could we could send you to an F16 unit, and so he basically talked me out of it, and to this day I'm thankful he did. I'd still like to fly the, have flown the A-10. It had, it had that big 30-millimeter Gatling gun. But, uh, yeah, it was the best thing that could ever happened. And so uh, based on your performance, basically, that's that's how they selected uh, what your next assignment was going to be. Right. And so um, so I went to the F-16 from there in the active duty. Yeah, I'm going to so, talk about that. So, um can you talk us through some of your ground and flying training and did it feel like a massive leap forward coming from the 37? Yeah, uh, obviously the, the technology, but, uh, so from Tucson, I went to Luke air force base, which is in Phoenix, just up the road. Um, it was about a year long program and all of us, all of us in my class, there might've been 16, 16 of us were, were captains at the time, young captains. And we were all really eager to fly the F-16. At that time, the F-16 was pretty much coming upon its uh, the proven ground, so to speak. It was they'd flown them enough, they'd had enough crashes with some of the with some of the uh, flight control problems they had with it early on. But uh, we were really all eager. Uh, Technology-wise, the thing to me was just amazing. Um, the the training was about a year long, um, as I recall, and it wasn't very long. You might, I think, maybe after my third sortie uh, with an instructor in the back. I think my fourth sortie, they soloed you. So um, things happened really quickly. But um, the th the airplane, I mean, at the time, it was just such a neat airplane. Everything talked to you. Um, people talk about. Even today, you know, because the flight control, the stick only moves about a quarter of an inch. And really what it's doing is it used to be it wouldn't even move. And it was just measuring the pounds of force mm -hmm. that you were applying to it. And then it would uh, go through the computer and tell the, the flight controls how much deflection to make based on the pounds of pressure you put on the stick. And they ended up changing that, as I understand, when we were in it. They, they, met the, they made it move like a quarter of an inch or something. So you, get, you had some type of feel. Right. Um, but, you know, the first few times you flew it, you would kind of get into a ratchet roll when you rolled the aircraft. It would roll and then just stop because you weren't used to the way the, the flight control and the stick worked. But um, 
overall, really, it was really a very easy aircraft to fly. Looking back on all the different aircraft that I'd gotten to fly, it was very simple to fly. Um, landings with the with the with the gear real narrow. You know, they could be a little challenging, but to employ it. And, and not have any switchology errors during your, your flights was the challenge, especially if you didn't fly it every day or every other day mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. there was just so many systems and so many buttons, as I remember, on the uh, on the stick and the, the throttle. But uh, so you, you basically went there for a year. The first few rides were basic uh, pattern rides. You got to get the feel of the aircraft and – and then once you had done that, um, you started doing your more of your missions and what you were going to use it for, air to ground and air to air missions. Um, um, and and the time went by really quickly. You were also you were also in the in the safe a lot, as I recall, which I didn't really enjoy. You were in there studying uh, yeah. uh, threats. You know, they wanted you to learn the threats before you got to your your regular squadron as much as you could. Uh, but uh, the time went by fast. That was probably one of the, the more pleasant training environments I'd ever been in. Phoenix okay. was was much better. I liked the city more than I did Tucson, even though it was, the climate it was hotter there. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was it was a fun time. I have nothing but good memories of uh, Luke Air Force Base there. Absolutely. And what was your first reheat takeoff or afterburner in American? Uh, what was that like? That power must have been incredible. Well, I, I do kind of remember that to some degree, but I, I kind of liken it to, I remember when we were in basic training, when we flew the T-38 for the first time and we took off in that and you're in the front seat and you're going, oh my God, we're just we were just booking down the runway <laughs> and you always, you just kind of thought to yourself, if something bad happened directionally, we're done. We're, we're toast. And so the, the wind rush and, and seeing the ground go by you in a T-38 was um, pretty spectacular. And then you flash forward to the first ride in the F-16 and it's like <laughs> multiply that by about 10 <laughs> because, you know, you can feel yourself an afterburner kind of getting, push back in the seat a little bit but right. man the acceleration and the ground going by you that fast and you know the first rider a couple of rides or so you're thinking man if something bad happens you know yeah you got the little yellow handle between your legs to eject but mm. it, it's going to happen so quickly and then after a while you do it over and over and you basically you know <clears throat> I'll use a term you get desensitized it's like right. hey this is normal and so it didn't bother you anymore. But yeah, there was things happened very, very quickly, um, and more so than the next jump from that was when I got to my regular squad. And towards the end, there, some of the squadrons did pick a, a few people, and uh, I got to be one of their uh, FCF pilots. You probably heard functional check flight pilots. So when they take their aircraft out of maintenance they they take them up and you ring them out and you go through a profile to check them out well i got to do that in f-16 at hill when i was there and on a cold day the airplane is completely clean cool. and you would slam it in afterburner and as soon as you broke ground you had to get the gear handle up or you're going to overspeed the gear and by a departure into the runway you're well past 350 knots and, you know, the, the profile at that point was to pull the nose up and you had to physically, you know, you had to G it up to keep the airspeed from building up because you wanted, as I recall, I think you wanted to roll out at 15,000 feet. You did an emblem and rolled out and you wanted to be at 300 knots. So you had to pull it around to bleed the airspeed off uh, and, and climb up there. And then, you, you know, you did some acceleration checks. You went up to 30,000 feet. And uh, then climbed it up to 40,000 feet. We would head west across the Salt Lake. And uh, you'd, you'd, you'd be at 350 knots or whatever. You'd hack your clock and put it in the afterburner. And you were watching the, the, the stages of the afterburner light and, and the nozzle changing to make sure it was performing like it should. And you were timing, uh, you were timing the acceleration to see how fast you got to a certain Mach number. And we'd only go to maybe one point. Uh, 1.2 mod, but you timed it and it was supposed to accelerate uh, in a certain amount of time uh, if it was performing like it would. And then you go out into the area and do the flight control checks, the 9G turns and all that stuff. 
But uh, yeah, the thing was just an amazing performer, especially if it were clean. And oh, especially, yeah. especially, you know, Hill, you know, I don't say like it was the best, but I think Hill was probably one of the premier wings at the time in the F-16. Shaw was a close second. But that's where they, they put all the newer F-16s. Um, and, and, man, once we got Block 40s, uh, GE engines with the big lip, that thing just wouldn't slow down, and I mean, it was just an animal. Of course, now you got the F-22 and the F-35s, which are next generation, and they super cruise or whatever. But at the time, it was a cat's meow, and uh, as a fun airplane to fly. Absolutely. So let's talk about a bit about your time at Hill. Um, was a squadron a mix? Was it air to ground, air to air, and which did you practice most? And also. What did the F-16 do better? Was the one, uh, you know, a flight that did like better air-to-air or air-to-ground? Uh, the 388 attack wing that we were in, there was three squadrons. There used to be four. Um, the F-4s went away. The F-16s came in. And I was there, like I said, it was, they were pretty mature at the time. It was a, a plat weapon system at the time. And so, um, our mission in all three squadrons was primarily air to ground. We were bomb right. droppers. Um, so, um, yeah, that's what we practiced mostly. Um, you would obviously go out and, and do practice just intercepts and you'd do basic fighter maneuvers and you would do some DACT. But none of that was to the extent that it was when I, when I left active duty and went to, uh, to the Kansas Air Guard. Uh, where those guys, w we did everything. And, of course, even in an air-to-ground role, uh, I kind of liked that role. The, the aircraft, obviously, it was a multi-role aircraft. You know, it wasn't night-capable at the time. But um, you did all the, mission, all the missions, Mike. I mean, you did everything in the yeah. thing. And you had to be prepared to do air-to-air -air if somebody bounced you or tapped you. You know, you had to be able to defend yourself. And so you got to do some of those types of air to air sorties. But again, you never, I never felt like at that time, I was there for three years at Hill Air Base. And uh, I never felt like I was very good at air to air because we just didn't get to, to practice as much. I, I'd say we were at least 80% air to ground versus oh, wow. air to air. It was, that, that's all we did is we went and we practiced, you know, dropping and, you know, how to, how to attack targets depending on what the threats were. And, uh, you know, I never made it over to uh, uh, to the war, the, the first war uh, in Iraq. Uh, but I perceive, my perception is it's, it's very much like what we trained, the desert out there in, uh, in the Utah Test and Training Range, huge mountains. It, it looked like identical. Um, and I talked to a lot of people. That there was a guy that, one of the guys in the squadrons that wrote that that book called Vipers in the Sand, I think. Oh yeah. yeah. And I knew mo almost every one of those guys because I flew with them. Mm -hmm. And um, he wrote it as if you're actually sitting in the aircraft and going through all the switchology and everything. And so, to me, as a as a former uh, sixteen guy, it was really interesting to read. Other people may not appreciate it as much because. They didn't know what he was necessarily talking about so much. But, um, you know, talking to him, he said it was, it was very much like flying in the in the training ranges, except this time people were really shooting at you. They were shooting back at you. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, that's what we primarily focused on. You know, we got to, we got to drop and, and, and uh, all the different types of munitions, CBU, uh, we got to shoot the Mavericks. Uh, yeah. We'd go do the, the we'd go do the uh, missile sh sh uh, shoots down in uh, Florida. Um, and pretty much the whole gamut um, we got to, to do in the F-16. And and again, it, it, it you, you maybe never got really really good at one thing, but you got to do a lot of everything. So it's a really it's really a challenging mission and. I think you got rewarded more. I, I liked obviously flying it a lot, uh, but you worked a lot harder because you were doing everything. You were, Do it, yeah. Of it's course. like yeah, one of your sure. interviews. I think it was the guy from, I can't remember his name, but he talked about yeah, you 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 
you'd come up to the squadron the night before and you looked at the schedule and if you saw your name on the schedule you go okay who am i flying with um, yeah. <laughs> who's in my flight yeah and then it's like okay from that day from that moment on you were your mind's racing okay i gotta get ready i gotta plan the mission uh, i gotta get my briefing set up i gotta go brief it and then you get to go fly which is the fun part and then you got to come back and you debrief it and so it was a lot of work and you know you were if you were the flight lead people were throwing darts at you but that's the that's the way that community the fighter community was that's how we learned it wasn't like oh you did that really really well it was always you messed this up you know why and you were always trying to uncover everybody's mistakes and so to get a perfect ride that was what your goal was always to do bombs on target on time uh, negate all the threats and you know, you guys, I'd throw in a, let's have fun because that's why we're doing it. But um, it was a lot of work, a lot, lot more work than any of the communities that, that I flew in, you know, whether it be bombers or, or tankers or whatever. And every community had their different pros and cons to them. But, uh, yeah, um, that was typically uh, what we did at uh, Hill Air Force Base. Here to go. Yes, so let's go on to your time in the Air National Guard and let's talk about DACT because you said like when you get to the, the Guard, you kind of do a bit more of that. What was it like flying against, uh, you know, the types of the time? I'm guessing you went against F-18s, F-15s, the likes. Tell us about that, Tony. Well, well, let's back up. So, you know, DACT, so the first time when I was at Hill, the first time I got to fly at the similar that, that I can recall was... We would take a squadron, uh, there was three squadrons, and we'd rotate them and do a fair weather deployment because the weather was always bad in the winter there. So we took our, the first deployment that I remember, we, we went to George Air Force Base and they had F-4s there. So nice. we're going to go up and do a dissimilar sortie against the F-4s. So we take off in a little two ship and I'm with my flight lead and I'm fairly young and we start the fight and and I remember being on the wing and I look down and I just visually pick up these F fours. They're kind of smoking and you could see them way down below. There they are. And I go, Oh, that's, that's, that's the bad guys. So we roll <laughs> in on them. And as we're rolling in on them, they eventually either via radar or visually pick us up. And, and I see them start turning and I go, huh, what are they doing? They must not see us because it was this huge arcing turn but that's all the you know that's the, that's the best rate turn they could give you and so you could see right there the difference in performance it was clear crystal clear like oh my god this thing they they, they can't turn at all and i don't mean that in a bad way but at, at the time they were the best there was but the f-16 the, the turn radius you know, three thousand feet was way way smaller so that was the first time i did any dissimilar now take it from there i'm out i go to the kansas air national guard um we were all full-time instructors there and we did a lot of dissimilar we did a lot of air to air there was a former f4 uh, squadron there that was a weapon school for the air national guard oh, and they were all very very good pilots and they flew the f4 very well but uh we would take our students or when we had uh, flying time left over and we had to fly the time, we would do continuation training, just our own, our own IPs, and we'd go fly against, uh, say, the F-15s or somebody. Um, how did the F-16 compare? And I know you've, I know you've talked to the Hornet guys, and, and you know, but for an, for an example, I don't know at the time then if it was so much the the, the aircraft or the operator, because I can tell you and this one sticks out in my mind, We St. Louis was pretty close to Wichita, Kansas, and, and those guys, uh, they were F-15 uh, guys at that Air National Guard unit, and they were pretty proud of themselves. They, were, they would primarily hire weapons patch uh, active duty guys coming out of active duty that were weapons officers, or you had to be pretty, pretty, pretty good aviators. So... We did some continuation training. I remember going up with uh, with this uh, this other guy, and he briefed it. And 
Mike, I, I got to tell you, I don't mean this in a bad way, but it, it shows you the difference. It's not necessarily the, the aircraft, it's the operator, but we would go, we would start the fight and we'd do our intercepts coming at each other. And at a certain range, we were, we were flying res cell, which means we were like fingertip. And we do whatever we had to do to, to win. We it wasn't you know this like we go to war type of thing, but we would do a tactic that we knew we, we could probably have the best chance. Remember the F fifteen at the time they had the AIM seven, and so you had to you had to figure out how to get around their radar so they'd lose you so you could get behind them. Otherwise, they're going to shoot you in the face with their their AIM sevens. Mm -hmm. And so we stay in res cell, and they're going to see us on their radar as one target. They don't know. They think, well, there's just one one contact. And in a certain range, we would split. And so I would I'd make a hard right turn descending straight down. And the flight lead would start a left-hand turn, climbing turn upwards. And they would glom on to him. And they'd lose me in the beam. It's a Doppler radar. If you get yeah. in the beam, they're going to lose you. And so I'd take a huge vertical down. He's dragging them away. They're glommed on to him. And they're chasing him as a two ship, and a lot of times I pull back up, and you wouldn't want to put your radar on him because you're going to spike their their warning, their raw warning gear, and then they're going to know that oh, he's over there somewhere. And a lot of times you can look up and just visually find him. So after the fourth time in a row, I came around and got unobserved shots basically on him. <laughs> Asked the flight lead, we're almost out of gas. I said, hey, you want to be the shooter? And he started laughing. No, no, you're doing just fine. Anyway, the point being is, you know, whoever was there, they were probably new operators or, you know, hadn't flown in a while or whatever. But radar discipline was really big in, in the air-to-air -air role. You know, you got to have one guy searching this part of the sky and the other guy has got to be searching this part of the sky because if you lose – you know, the, the target in the beam, then you're going to lose him. And so you still have to, you know, search that piece of the sky to make sure you pick him up when he starts coming at you. Now contrast that with the Hornets. Those guys, their radar was, I don't know, is King Kong. You probably are aware that the, the raw what is a radar homing and warning device, a little scope, not only would you get a depiction on the scope of the threat, whether it's air-to-air -air or a uh, surface-to-air missile, you'd also get audio in your headset, different types of beeps and squeaks. Well, the Hornet, you know, a lot of times when you're fighting, you're busy looking at the radar, at, at, your, at your radar, where the contacts, you're talking, you're flying. And the, the, the raw scope was just kind of over there, but you wouldn't get any audio a lot of times from the F-18. So it wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't bring your attention over there to see where is he, is he looking at me? Does he really have his radar on me? And so again, to fight them, you're trying to, you're trying to, you're trying to go around them and get outside their radar coverage. Mm -hmm. And so you'd do all that and you'd, you'd see them on your radar. Well, it looks like they're, they're leaning over this way. They're north of me or whatever direction. I think I got around him. And then all of a sudden you hear on the radio, Fox one <laughs> Viper in the, the Southern part of the, you're dead. And you go, Oh crap. <laughs> and, you know, how did he do that? Um, so that was, uh, that was kind of the way that that operated. I always thought the F 18, even today, two engine, there's really not a lot of alpha limit on a thing. I thought that was one of the most uh, spectacular fighters in the inventory uh, of our services really. Um, as far as close fighting with them, if you wrap it up, and, I, and I've again, I've looked at some of your other interviews when you interviewed the, the F-18 guys, you could fight with them, but you had to be in the right environment, and you had to know kind of where you were at. You didn't want to get slow with them, because even if you got slow with them and you were above them, they could jack that nose up at you and point at you and always threaten mm -hmm. you. So you had to maneuver, and now you had to come back down. So they were very, very good um uh, they're very challenging fighters to fight against. Um, the F the F fifteen. Um, the difference there, well, they had the again two big motors, and so if you got you, you didn't want to get slow with them. If you were down at fifteen thousand feet, you could outrate an F fifteen all day and oh yeah, turn turn circle and defeat them. 
Um, but for example, I mean, I don't know if many people did it. One time we're down at Holloman and I was, we just did a BFM uh, set with an, an F-15 guy. I went out and we were, did some BFM and I said, you know what? I don't know. And he didn't really know either. Let's just start at line of breast, 3000 feet, 300 knots and plug it in the plug our airplanes in the afterburner and see what happens. <laughs> and very few people know w- what do you think is going to happen? Who's going to, who's going to, I reckon F-16. Huh? I reckon F-16 would push ahead. Well, as a matter of fact, that's exactly what happened. We go into afterburner, and I start out accelerating and go ahead of him, and I got maybe half a mile in front of him, and I'm looking back, (laughs) and after five, ten seconds, all I see is these big square intakes coming, and that guy going, boom, right by me because (laughs) the power. You got two big... Engines there, and eventually it builds up the momentum and went right by me. But the F-16 would out accelerate it initially, and I don't think a lot of guys even thought about it. But anyway, uh, so yeah, DACT, we did a lot of that. We would typically uh, in the guards because we had students to get them to similar. A lot of times, our, one of our funner missions every summer, one of the squadrons would go up to Alaska to uh, Anchorage because they had the F-15s there and we wanted to get our students to uh, fight against similar aircraft. So that was always fun. And of course the Kenai river and the Russian river was, I, it's always fun to go catch salmon up there. But, uh, but yeah, that was, that was some of the differences I remember, uh, air to air. Um, you know, people ask, you know, would you rather do air to air or the ground? Again, I look back and, you know, I, I came up in an air to ground role in the F-16 and, and I still prefer it because I thought that there was, there's was more to do. It, it, there was more planning involved. Um, air to air, you kind of, you're just doing kind of one thing, you're capping or you're, you know, fighting. It, it was a lot fun. It was a lot of fun. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, when you get like in a 16 ship or 24 ship F-16, you're doing this, this big, large force employment elephant walk and you're going against these targets it can get pretty exciting when you got a four ship rolling in on the same target that the other four ships rolling in because you got stacked up because somebody bounced you and your timing got off a little bit and everybody's going down the chute and it's like man i hope we don't hit each other um but uh yeah i kind of preferred air to ground because you were doing everything you you still had to be prepared to get tapped by somebody and Real, in the real world, you were going to jettison your, your weapons or your tanks and go do air-to-air and fight them and survive. So. Absolutely. And it sounds like you had an incredible time on the F-16. But, yeah, how many hours did you get on the jet? And, yeah, do you – I mean, would you go back and change anything or was it perfect for you on the F-16? <laughs> well, <laughs> getting into the uh, – the F-16 uh, – Again, it was it was state of the art at the time. It's like flying the F twenty two and F thirty five now, I suppose, um, when we had it. And um, I don't think I would change a whole lot. Um, I just wished, you know, when I when I left active duty after eight years was my commitment from from school, the Air Force Academy. Everybody thought that, oh, you're going to quit. You know, they wanted me to stay in active duty and, you know, I was, I was progressing, you know, as well, average or above average and, you know, stay here. and You'll be in leadership. Role. I, that wasn't my interest. I wanted to go home. I didn't want to PCS and, and change uh, to a new location. And so the guards afforded that. Um, uh, so when I discovered uh, at Luke that, there were guardsmen that were converting from the Kansas Air Guard at that time from the F-4 to the F-16. I saw these guys, and they had they wore these baseball red baseball caps that said the Kansas Air National Guard. All right. And I go, huh, I didn't even know we had a guard unit in my state in Kansas. Oh, wow. I, I was totally unaware of what Air National Guards wore, or even the reserves. And, and I said, you're flying F-16s? And so from that day forward... The, the three years that I was at Hill, I just had that in the back of my mind. I don't need to stay in the active duty. I can go to the Guard. And on top of it, the Kansas Air National Guard, because we were an atypical Guard unit, we mm. had 60, 70 full-time instructors. Wow. Um, and, and so it wasn't any different than the active duty, except we got to train, and the guys we were typically training were – 
were seasoned pilots already that were converting from the F-4s, A-7s, and all the different fighters into the F-16. So it was really a fun mission. We didn't have to do any schmoo gear, you know, practice chemical warfare or any of that. We were just training people to fly the F-16. So uh, a very good mission. I wouldn't change it. I wish I could have done it longer. Um, I expected when I when I when I left active duty, I was expecting to retire there. Having flown the F-16 for the next 12 years didn't work. Um, I ended up getting somewhere around, I was over 1,500 hours maybe in the F-16. Nice. But um, that's really mute. I mean, the stories were so short, um, but there's a lot of stories. You know, you compare that with other types of flying, airline flying. I mean, you get mega hours, but... What kind of what kind of hours are they? Are you droning? Or are you really doing something? So yeah. every every aircraft has a different mission, and um, there's pros and cons to all of them. <clears throat> so, but I really enjoyed the F-16. I wished I could have done it a lot longer. Um, but I had a lot of other experiences in the other two aircraft that I got to fly. I got to see, like I said, I got to see them all. Um, Absolutely, so, yeah. And every community, I don't care if it was fighters, bombers, attack or cargo or tanker, they all had a different environment. Everybody did things different, you know, in the bomber world, in the fighter world, you know, we learned in our debriefs, like the, the one guy, you know, we, we learned in the debriefs and it was always criticism. This is what you did wrong. This is what you did wrong. This is what you did wrong to make you think that, um, how can we improve? And, and the other reason, a lot of it was negative, uh, was because you know, look, you got to be able to take the heat. You're single seat, and you got to be able to make the decisions. And, and they kind of ingrain that in you. In the bomber world, for for guys in the air in the aircraft, I remember going through that training, and it was like everything's positive, positive. How you did that well? You did this well? You, no, I don't know. I don't want to know what I did well. I want to know what I didn't do well, so I can get yeah. better. And and that's that's totally different training in, in the bomber world. At least that's what I experienced. So. Absolutely. Anyway, that's 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 how many hours I ended up with, and I, I don't regret it. I just wished I could have flown it probably longer. Mm-hmm.